Today I'm going to give an overview of dimensionality reduction. This is one of the most fascinating tools that exists today for studying data and therefore studying nature. I'm going to start by giving a basic definition of dimensionality reduction and describe how most of these algorithms work in general. Then I'm going to talk about something which is essential to almost all these algorithms, which is the notion of similarity between two data points. And in a later video, I'm going to talk about manifold learning and the presence of data manifolds in nature. I'm going to try to classify different dimensionality reduction methods based on how they reduce the dimensionality. And I'm going to give an intuition behind the main step of a very wide family of dimensionality reduction algorithms. It's basically one mathematical step, but it took me a while to figure out a solid intuition for that step. So I think it's really important to present that. So in simplest terms, dimensionality reduction is about taking a set of high dimensional points or points that exist in a high dimensional space, or in other words, vectors which have more components than three, and finding a corresponding set of points in a lower dimensional space. That corresponding set of points can reveal many things about the structure of the points in the original space. So the fundamental idea, I think, is that if you have a set of high dimensional points that are close to each other, then the corresponding lower dimensional embedding of those points should reflect that similarity. So let me give an example which is harder to imagine, but really illustrates the power of these methods. So they took a bunch of small images of handwritten digits. An image is just a matrix of numbers representing the intensity. It turns out that if you just splay that out into one long vector by just listing the values in the pixels going down the columns, then that vector forms a very high dimensional point, namely dimensionality of the number of pixels in the image. And you can use that extremely long vector to represent your images. Despite being in a very high dimensional space, the vectors have some closeness some proximity to each other in that space such that when you do dimensionality reduction on those vectors you can pull out relationships which bring similar images close together in the representation and these images of numbers are a great example of high dimensional data but I want to point out that high dimensional data is not something which is kind of exotic or arises only in certain cases in my view, there's high dimensional data all around us because a lot of times you need a large number of attributes to characterize any given object that's part of a set. And you can only see the complex relationships between these objects by representing them as points in a high dimensional space. So for example, a person, if you rep wanted to represent a human being as a data point, you have information about them which you can list, such as their height, weight, their age, their sex, their ethnicity, or where their home is located. It's reasonable that you could get a hundred different unique pieces of information to represent one person. So each person becomes a single point in a hundred dimensional space. It just means they have a hundred numbers associated with them. The idea is that similar people or people who have a lot of attributes in common will be close to each other, spatially close, in that 100 dimensional space. So that when you do dimensionality reduction on that data and bring it into a realm which we can see, then you will be able to observe certain relationships that were difficult to see otherwise. Then you might even see certain clusters forming which represent distinct groups in your data set. So to conclude, dimensionality reduction is basically about finding a representation of your data which is able to elucidate uh, meaningful relationships. It's about tossing out irrelevant or redundant information so you can see those relationships more clearly. And different algorithms do this in different ways. One of the main things that differentiates dimensionality reduction algorithms is how they define the similarity between two points. So next we're going to talk about different ways of defining uh, similarity. So most methods will explicitly compute the similarity between two data points. If your data points are vectors, then the similarity is usually a function of the distance separating them. A typical function which is used is the Gaussian kernel, which has this expression, 
you can see for points that are very close to each other, have a low distance separating them, it gives a value which approaches 1. And then as the distance gets larger, the value goes to 0. And if you look at this as the normal distribution, then the parameter sigma is the width of that distribution. And increasing sigma will linearly increase that width or the neighborhood size. So it's really important to have an intuition for what the effect of changing sigma will be. For a smaller sigma, it's harder to gain similarity to your neighbors. So you need to be very close in order to register a high similarity value. And likewise, if you have a large sigma, then you're going to measure larger similarity values to your neighbors. If you're using this kind of similarity function, the value of sigma can have a really strong impact on the embedding that you ultimately get. Most dimensionality reduction algorithms will form what's called the similarity matrix or affinity matrix. This matrix will be n by n if you have n data points, and the value at position ij will be higher if data points i and j are close or they have some strong semblance to each other. And there's many different ways you can measure that degree of similarity between two data points some of which involve not just the points themselves, but also the points' relationship to their neighbors in the local area. The similarity matrix is extremely important for dimensionality reduction because a large family of methods will take the eigenvectors of that matrix, and once you do that, you're basically done, and you have your embedded data points. And in a later video, I'm going to explain the intuition for exactly why that is the case. The idea of similarity is very general and it doesn't have to always characterize the relationship between two vectors. Part of what I've been doing recently has been about trying to measure the similarity between two ensembles of points based on their shape. And I may make a video about it later, but next time I'm probably going to do the third topic there.